I had the opportunity this past week to connect with somebody I hadn't talked with for quite some time, and we didn't really talk. It was all done on Facebook or something like that, but you know how it goes these days. And the thing is that uh, Mark A. Miller, the composer of the music for the song that was just uh, sung, I Choose Love, uh, uh, set that set the lyrics that were written, and I can't remember her name right now, but uh, set the lyrics to music that he composed the night after uh, the shooting um, in uh, Charleston uh, and uh, at the Emmanuel African Methodist Episcopal Church. Um, Mark is a, a young African-American lay leader in the United Methodist Church. He is a, a professor or a instructor of uh, worship and music at Drew uh, Seminary uh, in New Jersey. Uh, he's someone that was at one of the one of the very first meetings that uh, Mike and I attended in Newark, New Jersey. Well, actually Patterson, but uh, just outside of Newark. Um, when we had moved here, and it was like the first official thing we did is went back to this church within a church <coughs> meeting. And Mark was there along with Gil Caldwell, the civil rights pioneer who we reference every now and then, who, and who has done uh, visited Bloom. This rather long contextual thing is to say, um, it gave me the opportunity to reconnect with Mark and say, Mark, 15 years later, finally, we're singing, you know, one of your songs is being sung in a Bloom worship service. Uh, but also to remind him that not to be outdone by Gil Caldwell, who had written a check to, as a donation to Bloom, Mark was about the fourth check writer to write a donation uh, to Bloom uh, back in 2002. And uh, he was happy to be reminded of that um, and also wanted to sincerely express his appreciation for the group uh, bringing the music today. I think that connection is important uh, because it's a relationship that we have that isn't always tended all the time, but it exists and it is real. And you'll hear more about that sort of thing. Let's pray. God bless us as we continue in our time together. We know you are blessing us. We simply acknowledge the fact that you are with us in a very real way as we are with one another and even when we are with only ourselves. We pray, loving God, that you continue to anoint us in this service by your Spirit so that the music and the words and all that swirls around outside of us and inside our heads is able to be a part of the word that you have for each of us this day. We look forward to the word that is ours and we pray that the meditations of our hearts and the words of my mouth are acceptable to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. I am fortunate enough, enough, fortunate enough to have never had much of a literal understanding of biblical phrases. Taking that, uh, that line of thinking a step further, my experience of God and Christian heritage has been relational for as long as I can remember. My faith springs from a sense of belonging way more than obeying. So the way I know that I am with God is first nurtured in a sense of spiritual relationship that transcends physical realms. Then knowledge comes in recognizing the presence of God in relationships with people I am working to embody a community of faith. Wherever I am and whenever I see good faith and love being offered and lived. The advantages of media and social media mean I can see and sense this globally. The presence of Bloom in the Desert Ministries, United Church of Christ and Reconciling Ministries congregation mean I can experience this personally. And my interaction in ecumenical and interfaith groups means I can recognize this universally. It is in relationships that I can recognize the presence and actions of the spiritual realm, which I embrace. Because I have decided to have faith in that, 
My actions are a response to what I understand to be the calling of our Christian heritage. I think we share some of this in common. So let's see. Luke is a gospel meant to speak to Gentiles, like you and me. I'm presuming, that is a presumption of my part, but um, I, I think. One scholar I read several years ago said that the Gospel of Luke is a presentation of Christian faith stories done in the style of an ancient Greece, ancient Greek romance novel. That would mean it was written in a popular style to appeal to a wider audience of the society at that time. Then and there, Rome was the dom dominant power for government due to military conquest. But the Hellenistic economy, also known as the Greek way of doing business, still prevailed in the Bible lands. Hence, the Greek influence on literature and language. Besides the romance novel style, it is clear from scholarship that the details of the storylines shared by the Gospels are customized in Luke, as well as in its continuation of the saga in the book of Acts. Many people understand the book of Luke, the Gospel of Luke, to be about the ministry of Jesus. But if we attach it rightly to the book of Acts, we see that the story concludes with the life of Paul. And understanding that these two books were written in Paul's time, basically at the same time as each other, and by the same author, it, the possibility emerges that Luke Acts was meant to lead Christian thinking among Gentiles to see Paul as the primary resource of their Christian faith formation. For this to be possible among progressive thinking people, we've got to lay aside anything ascribed to Paul that is negative and hurting to women and the LGBTQI communities. I can do that because of a January 2015 class on Paul I had in Doctor of Ministry Studies at San Francisco Theological Seminary. We don't have time to get into all the whys of that, so I will use a phrase popular with national leadership these days to support my point. Believe me. <laughs> I am not exactly sure what you see when you read the story of the Emmaus encounter and the recognition of Jesus in the breaking of the bread. Many people see this as a justification story for our communion rituals. This seems to be especially true for some who place all their understanding of experiential faith in sacramental action. But I think there is more to it. I think this moment in Luke's romance novel is a change in plot points that shifts attention from seeking Jesus as a spiritual teacher to our being the body of Christ in the world. Remember that this relational exchange in the Luke X presentation of the Gospel of Jesus, Peter, and Paul is written a couple of hundred years before the mumbo-jumbo creeds that give so many clear-thinking modern people indigestion. The creeds are thought by many to be the substance of Orthodox Christianity and, by many others, the font of dogmatic waves that often drown faithful living with unnecessary fears and confusion. In the United Church of Christ, we respect the historical creeds and approach them as informative, but not normative. That means we are called to think for ourselves about faith as we live for others. Where have I heard that before? Luke's Gospel says that the disciples recognized Jesus in the breaking and distribution of bread. In our modern Gospel, we see the core characteristic of, of our faith happening not only when we, have a, when we break bread on a Communion Sunday, but also when we share bread in hospitality and when we serve bread 
in a community food security program. And I hope we know that bread is seen as a universal metaphor for nourishment and nurture. In our liturgical worship, we offer the sacrament of Holy Communion on the first Sunday and a few other times during the year. But let us not forget that the interaction of faith found in sharing hospitality and in sharing with hungry, homeless, and homeless and working poor people in serving hungry, homeless, and working poor people is spirit-filled sacramental vitality. I'm going to say that again because I screwed it up. <laughs> Let us never forget that the interaction of faith found in sharing hospitality and serving hungry, homeless, and working poor people is spirit-filled with sacramental vitality. When we say Christ is risen, Christ is risen indeed, of course it is our faithful recognition of Easter resurrection. As we sense the excitement that we heard today in the Gospel reading, when we heard the phrase, Christ is risen, it's true! I hope we think more missionally than literally. The risenness of Jesus Christ that I think of most is the weekday work of human hearts to help people get better in their lives. Our Sunday weekly Easter reminder gatherings, which is what this is, are meant to be sources of week-to-week -week empowerment of the people of the Christian Church who are now doing our best to follow the new commandment that we love one another. Loving one another as Jesus loved his disciples is the way people will know we are credible in our church life. Not by reciting a creed or obeying religious laws that actually hurt people. Not all moments of recognition in faith are delightful and loving. There are moments we recognize danger, hopefully not too late, to learn or do something to prevent or stop it. There are moments we recognize needs and challenges that will sadden us and take hard work to fill and meet. These moments of hardship may be the ones that cause us to utter the prayers that can only be recognized as sighs and groans too deep for words. Recognizing the living spiritual presence of Jesus as friend and teacher in our midst happens when two or more are gathered. Due to the constant shifts in priorities and commitments in modern human lives, in our churches, knowing who these two or more will be is an ever-changing and challenging dynamic. I hope you don't think this too personal, but in the co-founding of this church, experiencing who shows up and who does not has been one of the most difficult challenges of Mike's and my morale and mission in our daily living. Thankfully, people have shown up. Thankfully, here you are. We are. Over and over again. Back in the mid-1970s, a seminary professor gave me a, a memorable moment when he said, incarnation, that fancy religious word, incarnation, means showing up. I surmise further that he meant it ain't only about Jesus. In 2015, a retired seminary professor, guest lecturer for that class I took on Paul in, Janu in that January, said the Greek words Paul used in writing actually talked about two Jesuses. One was Jesus Christ, meaning the man. The other was Christ Jesus, meaning the church. Just try that when you read scripture. Think in terms, when you see Christ Jesus, think of it as the church that was developing in Paul's time. And G Jesus Christ as the man who walked in Galilee. 
You see, way back then, some people thought the risen Christ was true as people breaking bread made him real. Unless the people show up to recognize one another and nurture relationships to do the mission of each church, Jesus might as well just be laying back in that tomb. If that were the case, I am not sure if the world would be better off or worse off. But since I share bread with folks who sense the risenness of it all, that point of my skepticism is moot. The recognizable excitement and relational mission that we share is really what's important to maintain and grow. Please remember that we are not called to mindless belief or blind obedience. The facts of history tell us that some say that's what the church and faith is all about. Don't believe it. Trust that the mission of risenness is with us. There are people here and elsewhere who depend on us and we depend on them. We depend on them and they depend on us to be the embodiment of eternal love in our communities and around the globe. And when we say Christ is risen indeed, we are committing. Let it be so. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen.